Here's an obvious statement. Naughty Dog's The Last of Us is a masterpiece. You could focus on so many different elements, and each one would be worthy of acclaim. Stealthy moments are intense and engaging, the designs of the infected are super unsettling, and of course that main theme is just beautiful. Picking just one thing to talk about is difficult, so I won't. I'll pick four. Summer, fall, winter, and spring. The Last of Us draws attention to these changing seasons with distinct title cards, and it's not just because the game needs to skip ahead as protagonists Joel and Ellie travel across the United States. Stop me if you've heard this before, but the four seasons mean so much more in The Last of Us. For much of the world, each season brings something different to the table, and not just weather. There's a mood, a feeling, and that's why people have favorites. The right answer is fall, by the way. Oh, come on, bro. Summer is prime surf time. Maybe, but the waves don't stay the same, and neither do we. Just as the seasons rotate year after year, so we also go through cycles. As co-director Neil Druckmann put it on the official Last of Us podcast, This story is not about Joel changing, this is about Joel returning to who he is truly is over the course of the game. So if Joel himself isn't changing, what is? Well, on a symbolic level, each season's aesthetics can tell us something different about this post-apocalyptic world. But more importantly, as combat designer Anthony Newman says on the same podcast, The original pitch for The Last of Us 1 Infected were meant to be this kind of background radiation against a story that was really about human conflict. Character pairings in the game reflect different aspects of that humanity. Joel and Tess, Henry and Sam, Bill and uh, anyone else, and of course the central duo of Joel and Ellie. That human conflict, those relationships and dynamics, they are intensely painted by the changing seasons. It's in the name after all. The Last of Us is about those who remain after the Cordyceps virus decimates the human population. They are indeed the last of us humans. Whoa, that's deep, bro. And it's going to get a lot deeper. Let's make our surfer dude happy and start with summer. Early summer, specifically. It's the longest season in the game by far, so we're going to divide it at the same point The Last of Us podcast does. That should be a pretty good framework. So let's start our summer break. That's the vibe here. In terms of symbolism, summer represents a time of childhood innocence, of open-ended possibility in the wider world. Just think about all the movies set at sleepaway camp or during that one magical summer when kids are off school. In fact, I've talked about one of them here when I compared the coming-of-age classic Stand By Me with The Legend of Zelda. And here's your obligatory reference to the TV adaptation of The Last of Us, because it's not the only HBO program to invoke this symbolism. Oh, my sweet summer child, what do you know about fear? We start the game in control of a summer child ourselves. Well, what if you saw everything through Sarah's eyes? And that became exciting because you're playing a much more innocent, um, not as capable person. So you feel the fear of the world kind of falling apart around you. Sarah is the perfect introduction to this world for the player. Her first encounter with an infected is frightening, but not only is it her first time seeing this horrific sight, it's also ours. Realistically speaking, every new sight, moment, and character is a first time experience for the player in this world, but starting with Sarah was wise. She isn't doing all the action movie stuff that the other playable characters can pull off but she does embody the most basic of tutorials for us, teaching movement, camera control, and basic object interaction. It's a smart, and of course tragic, beginning to the game, culminating with Sarah's death at the hands of a Fedra soldier. Oh no. Sarah. Not to diminish the moment, but it is technically a few days into fall when the outbreak starts. It's summer in spirit, but not on the calendar. So let's fast forward, just like the game does, to summer proper. 
If Sarah was our introduction to what used to be more or less our world, then taking control of Joel after the prologue is an introduction to the new world. Again, we're the summer children behind the controller here. Tutorials continue with crafting and combat and stealth, and we see how civilization has done its best to live on in spite of the Cordyceps Plague, establishing new norms in fortified locations. Here in Boston, there are military checkpoints, smuggling tunnels, and an overarching tone of soldiering on despite the losses. For Joel, that loss is of course Sarah. It's been no time at all for us as summer begins, but for him, his daughter has been dead for 20 years. He's a very different man after two decades. Gruffer, never looking back, solely focused on what's directly in front of him and his next move. There is no fatherly nature to him anymore. It's all about survival. But as summer gives way to fall, then to winter and spring, this hard exterior will crack. Despite all he's been through, Joel doesn't know it all, even though he often acts like it. Yeah, I get that, man. The waves have taught me some harsh lessons, too. Meeting Ellie is the flashpoint. Her very existence is an argument against Joel, thinking he knows everything about how the world works now. Under the hot summer rain, Joel and his partner Tess, along with us, learn that Ellie is immune to the Cordyceps virus. It's three weeks old. No, everyone turns within two days, so you stop bullshitting. It's three weeks, I swear. As smugglers, Joel and Tess have to be hip to everything going on in their city, but this is something completely new. Suddenly, just as an innocent summer child realizes that there's a bigger world out there, this duo learns that there's something beyond their daily routines in Fedra-controlled Boston. There's hope. There's possibility. There just might be a path to a cure. What the hell are we doing here? What if it's true? I can't... <sighs> what if, Joel? Of course, the most obvious label to place here is calling Ellie herself a summer child. She is that exact kid learning about the wider world and exploring it for the first time, going beyond the walls of Boston and actually seeing the outside. Ellie, on the other hand, doesn't know anything but the post-pandemic world, this post-apocalyptic world. In fact, she doesn't know anything except for this oppressive quarantine zone. So she's a tool for us to still find the innocence in this world, to find wonder and things that we take for granted. Ellie remarks on this new experience throughout the entire game, but it starts here, in the middle of a rainy Boston summer. Joel and Tess, as an experienced duo, introduced us to this new reality with their routine. But Ellie discovers things at the same pace as us, the players. We share a lack of knowledge. The first clicker encounter is a great example of this. It's teased out for a bit, with a spore-ridden corpse and an unnerving guttural sounds that give the signature infected its awful nickname. It's the first time Ellie's ever been in the room with one of these things, and the first time we have to take one down. As we move into the second part of summer, we share more first-time experiences with Ellie. The first pit stop is Bill's Town, aka Lincoln, Massachusetts. It's only a 30-minute drive from Boston, but that's assuming you have a car. Joel and Ellie do not. Yet. The pair arrives in Bill's town expecting to get a vehicle nice and fixed up by the man himself, but they wind up dealing with much more than that. We're going to talk about Bill himself in a moment, but let's focus on his town first. Summer is obviously reflected in the climate here, but as you should expect given the nature of this video, this town at this time of year represents something more. As we explore, we see vestiges of the world before the outbreak. Pastimes like gardening, listening to records, and playing arcade games are represented here. That last one in particular really sticks out to Ellie. I had a friend that knew everything about this game. We are still summer children like her at this point in the game. So for us, there are additional glimmers of hope in Bill's Town. These reminders of life before the outbreak. Are they a sign that the old way of life can be revived? Unfortunately, as the game starts telling us in this very same chapter, the answer is no. As stated, our goal is to get a car and get a move on. After reuniting with Bill and leaving his safe house, one of the first things we see is this corpse inside a green car. This is a sign. We are being told that our quest for a car isn't going to go according to plan. There is going to be a loss inextricably linked to this objective. And in fact, everything in this post-apocalyptic world comes with trade-offs. 
That's embodied by Bill himself. Okay, what if someone could survive by themselves? So it does two things. One is it, it sets up, okay, here's another way to survive in this world. And what are the pros and cons of that? It's taken Joel's philosophy, or what Joel believes his philosophy is, to the nth degree. Bill has a whole town, but no one to share it with. This level of security came at the expense of driving everyone away. Maybe it sounds corny, but just as he put up fortified walls around town to keep the infected out, he also blocked off his fellow human beings from getting into his heart. Oh, that's a bummer, bro. Friends are like everything. Joel recognizes this too. It's another moment where the know-it-all smuggler comes to realize there are other paths in life he didn't consider. Like Neil Druckmann said, Bill is an extreme example of what Joel could have turned into. Even Joel still has a lot to learn about other people. I mean, he didn't even know the first thing about Bill's love life. Who the hell's Frank? He was my partner. Our next pit stop is Pittsburgh, although this detour is more unplanned. The game's longest chapter opens with Joel and Ellie in a brutal, violent ambush, orchestrated by a group known as Hunters. Immediately, Ellie's understanding of the world, and ours by extension, expands once again. The hunters attacking us aren't driven mad with cordyceps. They're regular people who fell into a violent regime after overthrowing the Fedra forces that once kept them under heel. It's a nasty wake-up call for our crew. Their fellow man is just as, if not more, dangerous than the infected that roam the country. They overthrew the government control in their city, but what they built in its place seems just as brutal. And we just see how violent and how desperate people have become and, and how tribal they've become. And anybody outside the tribe is seen almost no different as the infected. It's just someone you kill for, just for survival. It's a whole new, dangerous world for Ellie out there. But perhaps even more worrying, the man she's traveling with has a lot of the same violent tendencies. How'd you know? No what? About the ambush. I've been on both sides. Oh. Understandably, their dynamic begins to change as we near the fall. The game might jump ahead in time between some chapters, but just like the adjacent seasons blend together as they transition from one to the other, we see the inklings of what fall will bring here in Pittsburgh. It all happens in the same building, the hotel. First, Joel and Ellie become truly separated for the first time since Joel agreed to transport her. At this stage, his promise to Tess is his only motivation to get back to Ellie and finish the job. Dad mode hasn't been activated just yet. In fact, when Ellie saves Joel's life in the hotel ballroom, he's indignant. There's no gratitude toward her at all. And you just hang back like I told you to. Well, you're glad I didn't, right? I'm glad I didn't get my head blown off by a goddamn kid. But then, as we leave that towering hotel for the fresh air outside, he starts coming around. The hard shell around Joel finally gets its first crack, and he asks Ellie to be his scaffolding sniper buddy as he descends to battle more hunters. I'm going to pass the baton to Ellie's voice actor Ashley Johnson to explain why this is so significant. That is such a huge turning point in the game and their relationship because it shows a massive amount of trust between them. And I think Ellie at that point already trusted Joel in terms of how capable he was and how safe she sort of felt with him to a certain degree. But it feels like the first time that Joel puts his trust in her and his life in her hands. And that lands with her. We'll take this turning point to make a transition of our own. It's time to move into the fall. Yeah, this is about as cool as I like it, bro. I hope it doesn't get like freezing later. Given that fall is a time when the leaves change and things start to cool down, the deeper meaning of the season ought to be obvious. Summer is for innocence and discovery, while the fall marks change, a time when people start noticing a difference. There's a good chance you studied Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken in school. The eternally famous poem is about this time of change, when we come to the crossroads of life and choose the path we'll take. And just as Frost compares the road he took, feeling thankful for his choice, we can start comparing how characters have changed by the time fall rolls around in The Last of Us. One of the biggest changes is that Joel has finally come around to the fact that he doesn't know everything. It took all of summer for him to realize that his methods of survival in Boston aren't the only way to get by in this world, for better or worse. Having learned that lesson, 
And having begun to put more trust in Ellie, there's finally some vulnerability under that gruff exterior. It shows as we approach the hydroelectric dam. Right there's a hydroelectric power plant. <laughs> uh, a hydro who? It, uh, it uses the river's movement and uh, turns it into electricity. How does it do that? Look, I know what it is. I don't know how it does it. I'm willing to bet that Boston Joel wouldn't have admitted that he didn't know that. He might not have even used that tone of voice, which features like 10% playfulness. But that's not the only thing that Joel admits in this chapter. His whole conversation with Tommy is a doozy. In fact, their talk reveals just how much they've both changed. We haven't heard much about Joel's younger brother between the prologue and now, but we get brought up to speed during that earlier walk to the dam. Tommy was always the wild card of the two brothers, drifting from gig to gig, not sticking with much. But that's not the man we meet inside the dam. This Tommy is a pillar of the Jackson community and a dedicated husband. He's turned over a new leaf, a new autumn leaf, if you will. Uh, I don't get it. Tommy is firm in his convictions these days, and as it turns out, that's the opposite of how Joel is feeling at this stage. The protagonist that we've spent hours with by this point doesn't want to carry on his mission, and he asks Tommy to take over for him, to escort Ellie to the Fireflies in his stead. You ain't talking about some walk in the park here. Jesus, boy. Have Maria get some of your born-again friends to do it. They got families too. Tommy, I need this. You see, in opening up to Ellie and forging an actual bond of trust, he's also reawakened his once buried fears. He doesn't want to see her die, and he doesn't want to be the one to fail in this mission. He won't even accept a sentimental gift from his brother, a photo of his daughter with her dad during happier times. Joel's voice actor Troy Baker perfectly describes this dejected moment. It's a moment of cowardice of Joel. It's a complete abdication of everything of who he was as a father and who he is as a mercenary who is paid to do a job. And he's going to be neither of those things. And what he's going to do is he's going to pawn this girl off to, she's going to die, but I won't be anywhere near it when it happens. The game never outright says why these fears are overwhelming Joel, but I think the answer is clear. He's already lost one kid on this journey, and I don't mean Sarah. Let's rewind just a little bit back to fall. Don't worry, I did not forget about Henry and Sam. Before Joel and Ellie leave Pittsburgh, they team up with a pair of brothers to escape the city. After a harrowing moment on the famous Roberto Clemente Bridge, the group winds up on the shores of the Allegheny River, near a suburb. As you'd expect, the danger is not over. Hey, this thing is a budget, man. Just go, get out of here. Sam, you stay close to him. Henry, we gotta fucking move! You keep him safe, go! On their way into the suburb, the group passes through a sewer system. At one point, they get separated, with Joel needing to protect Sam until everyone can reunite. There's a pretty gnarly fight with some stalkers during this story beat. Keep that in mind for now. Once we reach the suburb, we get another intense action sequence in which Joel has to outmaneuver a sniper, eventually using the rifle himself to defend the rest of the group. This culminates in yet another infected attack, one in which you'll have to shoot some runners right off of Henry and Sam. Again, I'll ask you to remember this. Obviously, this video has already been chock full of spoilers, but anyone who's played The Last of Us knows what comes next. The group spends a restful night in the safety of the radio tower, only for things to turn dark in the morning. Sam is infected, forcing Henry to shoot his own brother before offing himself. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! I believe this moment is what replays in Joel's head as we transition into fall. The way I see it, there were two opportunities for Sam to get infected when Joel was supposed to protect him in the sewers, and when he was supposed to keep the group safe with the sniper rifle. Whichever one you choose, Joel failed, and he knows that Sam's awful death is his fault. For those reasons, he cannot bear to continue with Ellie, for fear of losing yet another child. That would be strike three in Joel's mind. In some ways, Tess, in a lot of ways, Bill, in the most ways, Henry and Sam, when we go forward, these are all cautionary tales for Joel. Understandably, trying to pawn off Ellie causes a rift between them. Fortunately, this is soon repaired when they're forced to fight off raiders once again, and the two head off to find the fireflies at the University of Colorado. That's a giant ram. You guys were like some idol worshippers. <laughs> when it came to sports, hell yeah. 
While they don't actually find what they're looking for on campus, they do demonstrate more of the growing trust between them. Joel repeatedly leaves Ellie behind with Callus, their horse, as he opens up barriers that lead them toward the science building. In the end, that's where we see the ultimate demonstration of trust, and of a seasonal change, in Ellie. Joel becomes badly injured, which means it's time for our sweet summer child to step up her game and protect her substitute dad. Ellie shoots down multiple raiders while trying to get Joel back out of the building. Joel can barely move as his worst nightmare starts coming true. He is failing to protect Ellie, and it just might cost him his life. What I love is that it didn't just slam to black, but that there's this moment that's delayed so that Joel could witness the fact that he is no longer capable of protecting her, which forces her once again to be in a situation where people are trying to kill her, and she is the one that ends up killing. As our duo gallops away from the university, Joel slips off the horse and blacks out. It's rock bottom for him, physically and emotionally, and it takes us to the lowest point of the game. Welcome to winter. Oh man, I knew it was gonna get even colder. Now, when I say the lowest point of the game, I don't mean in terms of quality. Dramatically speaking, this is when things are at their worst. It's what screenwriters call the dark night of the soul. Just think about what winter means, historically. It was a time of survival, when people had to work together to make it through low temperatures, disease, and famine. Even now, snowy environments and media represent danger. The Thing uses an Antarctic base to create feelings of isolation. Final Fantasy VI opens on a snowy scene with an air of mystery and hardship. It wouldn't be the first time that classic RPG has inspired other games. In The Last of Us, winter is a single chapter, but it's an incredibly important one. In a poetic sense, the lowest point of the game involves the highest amount of danger. We start with Ellie having to fend for herself, hunting down rabbits and deer to provide sustenance to a slowly recovering Joel. Soon after, she encounters a fellow survivor named David. She's immediately suspicious of him. Something is definitely amiss here, but those feelings have to be put aside as the two of them team up to fight the biggest swarm of infected so far. Just as Joel and Ellie bonded through firefights and narrow escapes, she begins to do the same with David. Unfortunately, his true motives are revealed. Those were his men that got killed back at the university. This sudden turn against Ellie fits perfectly into the low point of winter. Cut to Ellie fending off David's men in the neighborhood where she's been nursing Joel back to health. This starts a dramatic series of crosscuts as we begin bouncing back and forth between Joel and Ellie's perspectives for the rest of the chapter aka the winter season. Every time we switch, the danger increases. Ellie manages to pull David's men off of Joel's scent for the most part, but doing so gets her caught by David himself. That's when we learn the true nature of this Donner Party-inspired group. They're cannibals. This chapter isn't just a low point in the story or in Joel and Ellie's arcs. It's also the lowest point for humanity. It's one thing to drive wedges between people using federal control, or to attack your fellow man out of a tribalist mentality, but there's something about stooping to cannibalism that's even worse than any of those. It's not like this group is using it as a last resort, either. We see inventory lists of human meat, and a full-on freezer where victims are strung up like slaughterhouse cuts. Of all the crimes we see committed in this game, cannibalism can easily be called the cruelest. That's why there's a feeling of increasing intensity as we switch between Joel and Ellie for the rest of the chapter. They're separated in a way they've never been before, with an awful fate looming over Ellie as Joel tries to track her down. He tortures two of David's men in an attempt to find her whereabouts, sparing no one even after he gets the information he was looking for. Fuck you, man. I told you what you wanted. I ain't telling you shit. That's all right. I believe him. As it turns out, that path of vengeance isn't even necessary. Ellie gets free and manages to take down David all by herself. In pretty much any other game, beating him would be a celebratory moment. The cannibal leader is dead, the innocent girl can go free, hooray! But it doesn't feel like a noble victory here. Our summer girl is totally gone by this point. Autumn Ellie was trained in combat, and now Winter Ellie is using that training to finish off David in an absolutely brutal fashion. And where we find where Joel finds her, 
is the moment where she transcends just incapacitation and it goes into punishment. It goes into this cathartic, I'm taking this out on everybody. This is for Riley. This is for Tess. This is for Sam. This is for Henry. This is for my mom. This is for everybody. Between the nature of the cannibals at this compound, Joel's giving in to straight up torture, and Ellie's unbridled rage, winter is a low point for everyone involved. It's dark, there's a blizzard outside, and everyone's doing regretful things. But just like a spring sun peeks over the mountains to start melting the snow, things shift again. As we begin to transition into the next and final season, Joel and Ellie share an intimate moment over David's dead body. He tried to... Now we see Joel the father again, um, whether it was a skinned knee from soccer practice with Sarah to this moment. There's one thing that I that Joel knew how to do very, very well, and that was to comfort in the time of, of pain. And to see that, and she recognizes that as well. It's like, oh my God, you're taking care of me in this moment, and you are here. And it's both of them finally making that connection. Through the darkest times come hard lessons and changed hearts. Ellie has fully transformed by this point. The girl who'd never seen beyond the walls of Boston is now at a mountain state resort, pounding in the face of a cannibal cult leader. Just compare the look in her face now to her first kill back in Pittsburgh. That one was done to save Joel. This one started with survival but quickly turned into rage. Joel exhibited the same anger, tearing apart two cannibals like a bear protecting its cub. His dad mode has been reactivated, but in perhaps the scariest way possible. And we haven't even started our final season yet. Oh, I've been waiting for you to get here, bro. It is so much warmer now. Spring has sprung, and the final chapters of The Last of Us are upon us. The symbolism of this last season swings in a more positive direction. Spring represents renewal, new beginnings, and growth. You can see that literally, as plants regain life from under the winter snow as things warm up again. But it's also reflected in books, movies, and all the other fun stuff we've talked about during this video. The Great Gatsby, for example, is set during the spring because it tells the tale of a new romance. In our case, Joel and Ellie are in a fantastic, well-bonded space after the darkness of winter. Given that our quest this whole time has been to deliver Ellie to the fireflies in search of a cure, there's even renewed hope for the world at large. Speaking of large, Spring's Bus Depot is home to one of the game's most beautiful scenes, in which Joel and Ellie encounter a herd of majestic giraffes. In terms of lore, they probably just escaped from the Seattle Zoo, but you already know there's more symbolism at play here. Given their height, giraffes represent perspective, seeing the big picture from a higher point of view. Ellie and Joel have that perspective now, She's experienced the best and worst of the world, and she's grown up so much in such a short amount of time. Joel was already a well-worn adult, but now he's dug up the fatherly sensibilities that he buried deep for so many years. I've mentioned movies a few times now, but one of the most cinematic methods to show a character doing something is to let them almost do the opposite. As the Firefly handoff draws closer than ever, Joel makes a last-ditch effort to essentially keep Ellie for himself. We don't have to do this. You know that, right? It's a calm one, but it's a last-ditch effort nonetheless. Joel is ready to throw away this escort mission to have a daughter again, even at risk to the greater good. He might not have accepted the photo of Sarah before, but if he's about to give up his quote-unquote new daughter, then you bet he's going to hold on to the photo now. Unfortunately, he can't resist that temptation for long. Joel successfully completes his mission, bringing Ellie to the Firefly Lab at St. Mary's Hospital. This is when he learns the truth. It's not that Ellie is immune, but that the cordyceps virus has mutated in such a way around her brain that she's protected from its harmful effects. Continuing this research means the removal of the virus and her brain. In other words, the Fireflies intend to medically end her life. Joel cannot allow that to happen. I've talked about hospitals a bit before, but in this case, a place of healing turns into a bloodbath. Screw the obvious danger, screw the potential cure, Joel is going to get his baby girl back. There's a reason you finally get your hands on an assault rifle for this climactic, well, assault on the fireflies. It's a weapon that symbolizes uninhibited rage, painting multiple targets without consideration. 
To be fair, it is possible to sneak your way through this situation and not kill any Firefly soldiers, but that doesn't stop Joel from shooting Marlene. Tommy's former boss, and the one who sent Joel on this journey in the first place, is the last person standing between him and freedom for Ellie. Let me go. Please. You just come after her. Now I want you to notice something. I've never once used the word hero or good guy in this video. Joel is the protagonist, yes, but that doesn't make him a saint. In fact, his past sins and failures are what define him, whether they be moments of unregulated rage or an admission of violence like his history with the ambushes. And I like the idea that they were seeing it that way and that people make the argument for Joel as the bad guy. And to me, it's like you can make the same argument with equal weight that the Fireflies are the bad guys. Um, that here are people that are willing to kill a kid in the hopes of making a vaccine. Druckmann is right. There's ambiguity there, and it's up to the player to interpret that. I can tell you what the four seasons mean in a literary sense, but I can't tell you how to apply them to your personal convictions. What I can do is point out that Joel objectively lies to Ellie about the situation after the fact. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that are immune. It's dozens, actually. Though, again, there's a question of whether or not you think the lie was justified. I think that is where the fault was with Joel, but I get why he lied. Because he can't live with her being disappointed in him. The consequences of his lie are too big for this video. They're actually a big part of what drives the sequel. But as Ashley Johnson points out, the reason for the lie is logical. And it's not because Joel changed. Remember that Neil Druckmann quote we started with? Let's listen to the whole thing now. This story is not about Joel changing. This is about Joel returning to who he is truly is over the course of the game. Um, so you get to see the full spectrum of who this person is in the opening. And then we kind of hit a reset for him before we come back to it. That's the true spring awakening here. The journey didn't turn Joel into a different person. It revived the dormant father inside of him. As we saw at the hospital, Parents will go to any length to protect their child. They'll resort to violence. They'll turn on old friends. They'll lie. Just as summer, fall, winter, and spring cycle through in an annual pattern, we've circled back around to the beginning for Joel. Well, so like when I said it was deep, you said it was gonna go deeper, you weren't kidding. Well, it's been a very long trip, and I didn't even touch on everything we would have encountered along the way. I think the story of Ish and his sewer community, told entirely through artifacts, is brilliant. And of course, there's the spectacular standalone DLC left behind, which doesn't quite fit into our seasonal calendar here. Feel free to tell me where you'd place it in the comments. As for the four established seasons, we've now seen how they affect the game at various levels. The environment itself is affected by the weather, sure, but the innocence of summer, changes of fall, hardship of winter, and renewal of spring are also echoed by the story beats along the way. They're reflected in character dynamics, whether it be Bill's repulsion of the outside world, Henry and Sam's fatal brotherly love, or the central pairing of Joel and Ellie. When the adventure begins, they're shown as a know-it-all smuggler and a naive girl with no worldly knowledge. By the end, they basically become father and daughter, having endured unspeakable traumatic events. Ellie is battle-worn by this point, and Joel has allowed his father's heart to beat once again. Just as the seasons continue in their cycle year after year, the story doesn't stop there. Joel and Ellie's adventure continues with The Last of Us Part Two, where the new status quo set during spring is shaken. The sequel is an examination of consequences, but the first game is full of them too. Just look at Frank's lack of friends or David's attempted revenge on Joel and Ellie. As for the consequences of this video, I hope you've learned something about how the four seasons can be used as symbols in storytelling, be it a video game, TV show, movie, or book. And if for some reason you've made it this far and haven't actually played The Last of Us, you should totally do that, okay? Okay. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what Framework is doing, definitely hit that subscribe button in the middle. It would help me out an awful lot if you do. And if you want to see what we've already cooked up, you can hit that link on the far left. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.